Good afternoon to you. Mark Sutter, HurricaneTrack.com, here with your Hurricane Outlook and discussion for the 16th of June, 2017. Things are starting to get busy. The very latest tropical weather outlook just coming out now as I'm recording this. The uh, area which is now uh, 92L, the system way out in the tropical Atlantic, 30% over the next 48 hours for development chances and 50% through the next five days. Then we have our system that's trying to develop in the Western Caribbean, eventually the Southern Gulf of Mexico, 10% chance now over the next 48 hours and 60% over the next five days. And their maps probably have not updated just yet. Let me see if, uh, oh, let me get out of this so we can go back and we will refresh the page, see if the maps have reflected this. Nope, not quite. This is still the 8 a.m. map. Let's go to the five day because generally the development area potential cones, whatever you call them, uh, haven't changed much. Here's the system in the Gulf, or eventually. And then here is what we call 92L, and that is simply a naming convention that they use, uh, the numbers 90 through 99, to identify a suspect area as being a little bit more interesting, or what they call an area of investigation or an invest. And the letter L is, of course, for Atlantic. And we've already had a 90 and a 91L, and now we have a 92L, and that's located right in here. And I'm actually more interested in this overall than I am this mess, although this may eventually come up and try to maybe bring some rainfall up in this area. We'll take a look at all of that, but let's first focus on this system here, and you can clearly see a pretty good rotation associated with it, counterclockwise turning. You can also see that the winds are not too strong. These upper level cirrus clouds right here are just kind of gently blowing off or just kind of fanning out, meaning we don't have upper level winds screaming across the top of the system as it's trying to move off to the west underneath. And that looks like scissors, right? It gets sheared. That's not necessarily the case with this system. And so it has a shot at developing. A wider perspective, uh, this is interesting because you know here's 92L, Another pocket of energy, and then more tropical wave action over Africa, lining up as a favorable setup with the Madden Julian oscillation, and maybe even, as I read on Twitter, what's called a convectively coupled Kelvin wave. Don't even get me, hey, that's a story for another day. We want to make this simple, and the simplest way to, uh, to describe what's happening, hey, things are favorable right now. And so we're getting these areas of energy coming off of Africa, what we call these African easterly waves, these tropical waves of low pressure. And this one down here, 92L, uh, might try to develop a little bit more as it moves off to the west. And it would be pretty unusual if we look at the development areas over the last more than 100 years, nothing in the box between June 11th through the 20th, dating back to 1851. Uh, And this system is out pretty far to the south here, moving off generally to the west-northwest with time. And it's got, as I just showed you, a 50% chance over the next five days of developing. Usually we see stuff like that way farther to the west in the Caribbean and Gulf, and then even more dense areas of development uh, in the southeast Pacific. So this would be certainly breaking precedent if it goes on to develop. Uh, and, And also note There's really no development areas, and not really, there's none in the Eastern Caribbean either, and that's going to be important. I'll point that out as to why in just a moment. Really not much of a surprise if you've been watching these updates all along, especially this year. Uh, We've been talking about this, this warmer-than-average water starting to sort of do its work, adding probably more instability, more energy. You know, some of these pixels in here, uh, probably close to this one to one and a half degrees Celsius above the long term norm, and so it 's not really that shocking and I mentioned this in my broadcast that I did on June the first as one of the keys to watch. I talk about keys to the game, these sports analogies that I like to throw out, and I said one of the things we need to watch this year, and it, this just goes without saying, I just wanted to point it out. Will we get early development out of this area, and if so. Considering the rest of the favorable conditions, this could be a potential check mark in the column of, yeah, it's going to be a, a quite busy season. June, it would be really interesting to have that. If we have more in July, 
preceding the normal start to what we call the Cape Verde season, which is usually August 15th or 20th, roughly in that window, through middle October or so, we would be preceding that by almost two entire months. That's remarkable. All right, looking at the Saharan air layer, is this an inhibitor? It is up to the north of 92L, pretty decent, still in the lower third of the scale, I guess you could say. And there's 92L down there. Let's get rid of what I've drawn and start over. Here's the system south of the Saharan air, and it's going to stay to the south. A strong surface high pressure out here, plus well, not so much at the surface. If it was very strong, we would have stronger trades, more of a deep layer high pressure system uh, steering this system off to the west and it's early this came off at a fairly low latitude and so it, was, it has that advantage and so it'll stay stuck in the easterlies and move right along and not turn out to sea uh, looking at the wind shear hard to see on the system it's just out of the shot over here but again upper level winds and you can look at these barbs they're going out away from the system in a clockwise manner like I talk about and you don't see any of these wind barbs coming across it like that and so that is definitely one other favorable piece of the puzzle meanwhile winds are still coming across our system trying to develop here in the Caribbean Sea and until that changes and we see them more fanning out in a divergent pattern instead of this cross the top of it pattern this is going to be slow to develop but that's a lot of rain in there a lot of energy and it may very well make its way up in here and try to affect somebody around this region. It's, it's hard to say. Uh, but let's take a look. Let's look at the GFS. This is the morning run, the 12Z run. This is the initial map. And it doesn't go far enough out to the east to on this particular realm that I have set up uh, to see the tropical wave out here, 92L. But what I want you to watch when I put this into motion is that 92L will come into the shot through here, the frame, and then watch what happens. You have sort of this monsoonal gyre, this monsoon trough setting up in here, uh, little tiny pockets of energy, something over here, and just watch as this all moves forward throughout the next, I think I set it to five days, so let's put this into motion, and then I'm going to scroll back down and we'll watch and see how things unfold. So you notice as we go through the time frame here, uh, a little bit of turning in the atmosphere here. This is the uh, 850 millibar level vorticity signature. And, you know, really nothing too dramatic. You got this little lobe that comes off up here. You know, that may or may not be accurate. The model might be overdoing this. It's hard to say. But then watch right over here. There comes the system. Let me scroll down just a little bit so we can see it. Fairly decent signature. And we're going to play this again. It'll come back again. Uh, and we're out to right at 120 hours. This is five days. Notice how it weakens at the end. So let's don't worry about this so much right now as I want you to watch over here as our system comes into the frame from the right. This is about, uh, what are we out about? Coming up on 48 hours. And you notice deep easterly flow coming across here, but not too strong. Trades are not just ripping through here. And then the system comes in here to the uh, frame fairly decent vorticity signature in there. It's small, but might have some tropical storm conditions coming through there. This just might make it and become tropical storm Brett before anything up here does. Whoops, I drew an arrow. Before all of this starts to, to congeal. Wouldn't that be something? We get Brett from an easterly wave as opposed to uh, the system. <laughs> I want that go away. Uh, oh, there we go, as opposed to the system uh, in the Gulf. Uh, so, yeah, interesting times ahead for sure. <laughs> There's that stupid arrow. Go away, leave me alone. So let's move on to, let's just get rid of this, all right? Bye-bye. I want to show you this um, as I lose my train of thought. Yes, there's a lot to watch in the tropics, but that leads us to what happens when something makes landfall. Okay, we want to make sure that we are ready. Let me get rid of that arrow, finally. So this is the old way uh, that we used from 2004 until through last season to collect wind and pressure data. You see in the background over here is the uh, aluminum tower that we sometimes take with us. Now we've learned that we can attach our anemometer to other things that are already high up, 10 meters or so, in some cases more than that. 
and we don't have to lug these aluminum towers everywhere we go, so that's a good thing. But notice, over the years we've had to use this laptop, and there's our software window that our programmer wrote for us. These are the cables that come in to this big old case from the RM Young anemometer and the pressure sensor. Uh, that's about a 70 pound AGM battery. This is the Davis pressure sensor that we were using back in the day. Uh, all kinds of wires and inverters and big blocks. You know, air conditioning wire right there to get power to everything. It worked, and it worked great. We collected some absolutely phenomenal wind data over the last 12 years plus. No question about that. So that's that's never been an issue. But this thing was heavy. It, it was susceptible to Windows updates, <laughs> whatever. It was horrible. That part of it. So hey, you know, you fast forward to 2017. There's that arrow again, and look what we've done. Uh, thanks to our programmer, his name is Jason Sikoski, and he works for SAS Institute up in Cary, North Carolina. Uh, I've known the boy since I was a child, and he's just wonderful at writing programs. And this right here is the Raspberry Pi. A tiny, tiny, this is smaller, uh, about the size of an iPod, maybe slightly larger, and about as thick as two decks of cards. And this is the new way that we will be collecting the weather data and sending it out to our app and to the website. Uh, the pressure and wind sensors plug into there. And look, it's powered by a tiny little uh, lithium ion battery and then a much smaller um, Duracell AGM battery. This whole thing weighs maybe six pounds at the most. It is fantastic. So my point is, if something like uh, one of these systems manages to develop, and make their way towards the United States where we can get to it, that's what we're going to be able to deploy and give you some of the most accurate wind data and pressure data that you can possibly ask for. So it all matters. Everything's all interrelated as I watch the tropics and report on it. We're also working on better ways to cover when these things make landfall, and that's hugely important. So a lot going on, and I'll be around all weekend talking about it. Twitter, Facebook, um, and of course, if you're not subscribed on YouTube, go ahead and do so so you can get notified when I post an update, and I will be doing so all weekend long. All right, that's it for me for now. Have a great rest of your Friday afternoon. I'm Mark Suttoth for HurricaneTrack.com. Thanks, as always, for tuning in, and I'll talk to you again tomorrow.